coming up tonight on VCU Insight. I'm Kate Conway. American students are heading north, north of the border. Reasons being, tuition is cheaper. We'll tell you how much. Two students were attacked on VCU's campus. Find out what VCU police are doing to prevent future attacks. Coming up, find out how a nonprofit is helping Richmonders living in food desert get access to healthy food. All this and more, VCU Insight starts right now. From the Richard T. Robertson School of Media and Culture at Virginia Commonwealth University, named best student newscast in the Mid-Atlantic, this is VCU Insight. Good evening and welcome to VCU Insight. I'm Artisha Johnson. And I'm Tiffany Hill. Thanks for joining us. The front yard of VCU is closed for renovations. Insight told you about Monroe Park's November 14th closures just a few weeks ago. And now that it's shut off to the public, the homeless who live there are feeling the consequences of the displacement. Cole Smith has more. For Leon Soroka, Monroe Park's closure on November 14th means living on the sidewalk for him and everyone else who used to call the park home. And now he says the cold weather has left him looking for anything to keep warm. Yeah, just right now, blankets, plenty, and a, a good sleeping bag the other lady gave me from the church the other day. Soroka says he and the other homeless people who lived in Monroe Park were given two months notice to vacate the area. But when time ran out and the walls went up, he and several others moved their stuff along Laurel Street next to the park, later being told to put their things in an alleyway next to the Altria Theater. Left with no other option than to sleep here on the front porch of the Grace and Holy Trinity Church outside of Monroe Park since its closure, these people will soon be allowed to enter homeless shelters for the winter. However, that will only last for a few months, while the park itself will be closed for much longer. According to VCU and the Monroe Park Conservancy, the entire park will be closed for the next 12 to 18 months during renovations. And after speaking with some of the homeless and several VCU students, their biggest question is why shut it down entirely, pushing out those who live there. VCU's presidential office executive and Monroe Park director, Brian Shaw, says he has an answer to their question. So all the substructure, all the utilities, the water, the gas, the electricity, all have to be dug up, replaced, and put back. While the renovations are completed, Leon says he will miss the park he called home, but he's looking forward to its return. For VCU Insight, I'm Cole Smith. According to the Monroe Park Conservancy, once renovations are done, the Park Conservancy will remain public. Everyone associated with VCU receives crime alerts, but what's it like when you're the person behind the alert? VCU Insight reporter Tiffany Hill talks to two campus victims and campus police. In September, VCU student Steve Gwaltney says he went out for a late night snack at Christian's Pizza in Richmond. He says he was viciously attacked, leaving him with a concussion and three staples in his head. According to VCU police, Gwaltney was one of three VCU students attacked that night. Another student, Gabe, says he was robbed not once but twice last month at gunpoint at his old apartment on Goshen Street. So something in the back of my head knew something was off. I opened the door and lo and behold, he asked the same question if my roommates were home. And I told him no, and then I hear a gun click, him cocking his gun back, and I looked down and he had a gun in his hand. But that was just the beginning. Gabe says the thief eventually stole his wallet and all of his electronics. However, if the crime occurred on the street, VCU's vast network of cameras could give police a clue to who invaded Gabe's home. VCU police captain Mike O'Berry says the camera system does help them solve some cases. To change the way that we investigate crime uh, here at VCU because the first thing we do is pull up the camera cameras and see uh, if it, even if it had just occurred, you know, some of our folks will be pulling that camera work up trying to get descriptions of suspects and things like that. Captain O'Berry also gave great tips on how to stay safe at night on campus, such as never walking down alleys like this one all alone at night. Also. There is always safety in numbers, never walk alone, and always carry pepper spray. I'm Tiffany Hill reporting for VCU Insight. Remember, if you have an emergency, call 911. Do you ever use your phone while driving? If you do, be prepared to pay fines for using any app if DriveSmart Virginia's bill is passed in January. DriveSmart Virginia has proposed a plan to decrease traffic deaths. 
VCU Insights' Michelle Dang has more. Drivers' eyes are focused on the road, but they're also glancing at Snapchat, Waze, and Instagram. 17,000 deaths in the first half of 2016 is the largest increase of traffic fatalities in over 50 years that was reported by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This bill that Drive Smart Virginia is proposing is an effort to continue the decrease of traffic deaths in Virginia. The current traffic deaths in Virginia is 643 instead of 676 like the previous year. It says that it is illegal to use any handheld communication device in a moving vehicle. Janet Brooking, the executive director of DrySmart Virginia, believes that if the bill is passed, police can crack down on distracted driving even more. And that would give law enforcement the tools that it needs to start to start getting, you know, cell phone use behind the wheel um, addressed. Ronson Ho admits to using apps like Waze and sometimes Snapchat. Because sometimes traffic is just going too slow. I'm just bored of life. So I just had to go on and check what's going on. An average of 35,000 distracted drivers around the nation have been killed in traffic accidents. One crash in Tampa, Florida was recorded on Snapchat in a car going 115 miles per hour. According to Brookings, despite safer highways and cars, the distraction of apps like Snapchat, Waze, and Twitter make our roads much more dangerous than before. For VCU Insight, I'm Michelle Dang. For more information, check out www.drivesmartva.org. A police officer put his life on the line and became the first campus officer in 27 years to receive a prestigious award for bravery. Sergeant Ian McAllister is the hero that received a Valor Award on November 10th for saving a woman who was shot multiple times. McAllister said he was unaware that he was nominated for the award until shortly before the event. I had a missed call from uh, Chief Bruce, I called him um, back and uh, he asked me if I was doing anything um, on that specific date and he said that uh, I was nominated and I was chosen to receive the Bronze uh, Valor Award. So, McAllister said that he was honored to receive this award, but his squad deserves recognition thanks to their hard work every day and especially that night. Coming up, a VCU student dies from a drug overdose. Find out what his parents have done to honor him. And how do you explain the tragedy of dementia? A former VC professor shows you how. The pain of losing a son from a drug overdose led one Richmond couple to help prevent this tragedy from happening to others, which is why they are supporting a special group at VCU. Artisha Johnson has more on this story. Rams in Recovery is a program to help students addicted to drugs and alcohol on campus, like hosting events and going on trips off campus. But their approach may be unconventional. People can be in recovery and have fun on a college campus, so um, don't just have to come to classes and then leave and not feel really part of VCU. Helping students to maintain and achieve a healthy lifestyle takes place right here at the Wellness Center. The Rams in Recovery hold their eight weekly meetings here for students on campus. The JHW Foundation grant given to VCU's Rams in Recovery has donated about $45,000 to the program this year. The son of John and Roz Watkins, also a VCU student, John Henry Watkins, died six years ago from a drug overdose. In the memory of his death, the Watkins started the JHW Foundation. We formed the foundation to help young adults in recovery and decided to focus on some of the areas what we as parents who were dealing with um, a child struggling with addiction. Roz Watkins says Henry was a loving guy, very intelligent, and a wonderful person. Um, ultimate goal is really to help develop sustainable programs to help young adults in recovery and to ensure they have good support systems in place and then to help raise awareness um, um, 
in the community that you know addiction is a disease and to you know help other families um, going through the process. For VCU Insight, I'm Artisha Johnson. The JHW Foundation will match dollar for dollar for the first $15,000 donations that come in for Rams in Recovery. 8,000 American students, that's how many moved to Canada in the last three years to pay cheaper tuitions and ultimately have a less debt when they graduate. Insights Kate Conway tells us more. While some students are granted scholarships and others work full time, it's still not enough when taking out college loans. With rising tuitions and student debt, the Fiscal Times says American students are choosing to attend colleges in other countries. Caitlin Kelly, a freelance writer of the New York Times and native Canadian, used to teach in the U.S. I taught at a place called Pratt Institute. Sixty-six zero thousand dollars a year to study writing, which is silly. And there were kids in the class who couldn't afford to go home for Thanksgiving. Of the 25,000 2013 graduates at McGill University, 55% were international students, says Time.com. University of British Columbia has also seen an increase in American undergraduates. UBC has just under 10,000 international students at the undergraduate level, and 10% of those are from the U.S. TopUniversities.com says students pay an average of about 5,000 U.S. dollars a year, and with the Canadian dollar being 70 cents to the American dollar, tuition costs are cheaper. Canadian residents are paying a maximum of six to $7,000 a year for the best school in the country. Fewer people say, I can't go to college. Canadians are heavily taxed, which allows tuitions to be so affordable. That tax pays for education and it pays for health care. Education is also seen as a right in Canada. The view very much is that it's a public right to access a university, especially if you bear the name of the province in which you are located. Kate Conway for VCU Insight. The top three Canadian schools Americans attend are University of British Columbia, McGill University, and University of Toronto. And keep watching our continuing coverage on student debt to find out how you can get free money and tuition to American colleges. The U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention conducted a study in 2013 saying Richmond has one of the highest HIV rates in the United States. However, the Richmond City Health District reported the city began to see declines this year in new HIV and AIDS cases. VCU Insights' Kate Conway is with a guest to talk about their story being HIV positive. Kate? Thanks, Artesia. I'm sitting here with Rodney Lofton of Diversity Richmond. Rodney has been the voice and advocate for those living with HIV for almost 20 years. He's also written a book titled The Day I Stop Being Pretty, a memoir which has been nominated for the Lambda Liter Literary Award. Rodney, thank you so much for being here today with us. Thanks for the invitation. My uh, first question I have for you is, do you recall the day that you were first diagnosed with HIV? Yes, it was uh, December 6, 1993 at 2.58 p.m. The number that was assigned to me was 1277597. Janine Dietz was the young lady who gave me my test results at the New York City Health Department in Chelsea. So it's a day that I certainly won't forget, yeah. Wow. Um, so what was your initial reaction when you first heard your diagnosis? Well, initially I just thought I would go and get my test, go on about my day, but unfortunately that changed. Um, I remember her turning the folder around to show me that I was HIV antibody positive, and I broke down and started crying. I started banging my head against the wall because the first thing that I thought was, how am I going to tell my mother? I'm the only child. And uh, so at that time, I just kind of felt completely defeated. And having to tell my mom that I was HIV positive was something that I wasn't really looking forward to because I didn't want to break her heart. Um, did you re receive a lot of support from your mom about when you told her about your diagnosis? Well, at the time, I was living in New York. I was working in the entertainment industry. And after coming home for Christmas, I shared with my mother before coming home for Christmas that year, I decided that I really needed to be back here in Richmond, where I'm, I'm originally from. And my family just rallied around me. I mean, there was, there was no fear that was associated, because prior to coming back, my family had educated themselves about HIV and the modes of transmission. So there wasn't that fear of, oh, you can't be around him because he's HIV positive. So my grandmother, I, I moved back weighing about 120 pounds soaking wet, 
And so my grandmother, of course, cooked wonderful southern dishes to help me, help fatten me up. But my family was great, and they continue to be supportive to this day. That's great to hear that. Yes. Um, my last question for you is, what advice can you give to those, um, our viewers, to help best prevent HIV and AIDS? Communicate is one, one of the important factors of preventing the transmission of HIV, as well as con con condom use consistently and correctly each and every time. Um, to know your status, you know, talk openly with your partner so that you can reduce risk that's associated with HIV infection. You know, based on what we know about HIV today, no one ever has to test positive. We know how it's transmitted, we know how it's prevented, but unfortunately we also know that every nine minutes someone tests positive for HIV disease. So know your status. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rodney, thank you so much for being here today. I've been speaking with Rodney Lofton of Diversity Richmond. Back to you, Artesia. Do you know how to explain dementia to your children? If not, former VCU professor Paul Gerber wrote a book recently that may help. Fergus and the Forgetful Frog is a children's book about dementia. Dementia is a memory-robbing disease suffered by elderly people. Dr. Paul J. Gerber and his wife Veronica teamed together to make this book after they found out three of their family members had this disease. When they went to visit their family members in the retirement home, they noticed children couldn't grasp the meaning of dementia. The Gerbers created Fergus and the Demented Turtle, but changed it to Fergus and the Forgetful Frog after realizing the title scared off children and parents. The Gerbers chose the name Ferguson because it means to forget in German. Still to come, Richmond's favorite soccer team could score a new home. Plus, a local art festival has international ties. We will tell you how. We've never been very good at sitting still. Maybe that's why we built our campus in the middle of a city. Why we put our classrooms on riverbanks, in Fortune 500 companies, even on stage. At Virginia Commonwealth University, learning happens everywhere. What matters most is how you make it real. Some Richmonders live in what are called food deserts, where healthy food is not available, but a local organization is trying to change that. Austin Moore reports. A staggering 18 million Americans live in a food desert, an area where there is little or no access to fresh fruits and vegetables. According to Wallet Hub, just last year, Richmond was ranked number one in the nation for grocery stores per capita, but it's still the number one food desert, according to the Virginia Food System Council. Areas in the north, east, and south sides of town have very few grocery stores. Meanwhile, the West End has multiple grocery store options. One local nonprofit organization, Tricycle Gardens, is trying to help alleviate the lack of healthy food options in these areas. Without access to grocery stores within walking distance, many Richmonders resort to buying their groceries at corner stores like this one behind me. Unfortunately, these corner stores, fresh produce is often not sold, and many of the items purchased are snack foods. Jason Tsai, the distribution coordinator for the Corner Farm Program at Tricycle Gardens, says that the program goes into corner stores and food desert constricted communities to provide access to healthy, fresh produce. Corner stores are oftentimes not just a matter of convenience for low income communities, they are the one stop shop for everything. The Healthy Corner Store Initiative provides refrigeration and marketing tools and offers food skills education to help families learn the skills needed to buy and prepare healthful, delicious meals on a limited budget. For VCU Insight, I'm Austin Moore. To learn more about what Tricycle Gardens is doing in Richmond, visit their website at tricyclegardens.org. The Virginia State Police reported 20, in 2014, there were almost 5,000 cases of forced sexual offenses in the state. And when these offenses do happen, police are sometimes left to investigate without much information. Insight's Cole Smith is in the studio with two guests who have created a program they hope will fix this problem. Cole? Thanks, Tiffany. I'm here with Joy Thondeek and Alan Warfield, the President and Vice President of Big Sis, a new Richmond-based program that lets women keep track of any aspect of their lives through stored virtual journals. These journals can then serve as a breadcrumb trail for police in case something happens to them. Joy, Alan, thank you both for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank um, you. I'd like to start off with my first question, and that is what info can women put into this program? Um, what is it stored in the database? 
Well, it's excellent because actually they can store anything. Um, it's designed for you to record your day-to-day -day activities or anything unusual. Um, you can share details. What we say is when you're creating your journals or your post, you want to think to yourself, what information would I want law enforcement to know? If a crisis should arise, what would they need to know? The who, what, when, where's, and why's. So that's what you can put in your journals. Okay, so Joy, are there mm -hmm. any security concerns for people who do put their information into this database? Once it's in, can it be accessed in any way? No, actually, we're really confident with the security of the site. Um, it, the site is hosted by Microsoft Azure, and then information is encrypted, so we're very comfortable with the level of security that the site offers. Okay, so Alan, mm -hmm. can you tell me how do police track down a suspect or a victim in case the worst does happen? Well, when um, our members apply, okay, we asked in-depth questions, you know, not only your name and address, but um, if you drink, what do you drink? If you smoke, what do you smoke? That way, and we also asked them to notify their friends and family that they are Big Sis members, okay? Now, due to those questions, if law enforcement is, you know, actually looking and something has happened to one of our members, um, they have left a trail. You know, um, we asked them, what do you smoke? What do you drink? That way, if there's some place and they leave a butt on the floor and law enforcement sees it, this is, this is, you know, this belonged to our victim. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. They, well, I'm sorry. They complete, a, they complete a detailed profile when exactly. becoming a member. And mm -hmm. so that's very helpful. So when law enforcement is notified or if a member should go missing, they contact us and we're able to give them access to all of those journals, posts, and profile that was created. Okay, so are there exactly. any added perks mm -hmm. to signing up with this, and how much does it cost? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the cost, we have two prices, $3.99 for the person who isn't as active, but, you know, um, do go out now and then, but we also have a $5.99 price, and this is um, as many journals as you want to create, in, and you can post from um, day to night if you want to, every mm -hmm. hour, every day, every month, as many journals as you want to. Okay, sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt, but that's actually okay. all the time we have. Mm -hmm. um, I've been speaking with Big Sis President Joy Thondik and Vice President Alan Warfield. I'd like to thank both of you for coming and speaking with me today. Thank you. Aww, thank you for having us. No problem. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, back to you. If you're a soccer fan in Richmond, good news. Richmond's professional soccer club plans to give the city stadium a much needed facelift. Sasha Jerome has more on what's new for the Richmond Kickers. City Stadium has served as the home for the Richmond Kickers for over 20 years. The city's professional soccer club has recently proposed that the city officially lease the stadium to the team with plans to renovate the nearly century-old stadium. Vernon Inge, president of the Kickers Pro Team, says that the proposed agreement would not only benefit the team, but also the city as a whole. The whole idea is just to make it a great community asset and a great place for us to play and give Richmond a great soccer experience. According to the Kickers, a huge part of their success is because of the enthusiasm of the fans calling themselves the Red Army. Fan involvement plays a big role in the experience of the game. And with these major renovations in the works, the kickers hope to make the experience that much better. Jose Espinoza, kickers fan and member of the Red Army, says he thinks the proposed plan for City Stadium is a great idea. Well, I'm glad this is happening because the stadium does need a lot of work. And I feel like once the renovations come, the atmosphere is going to get better, which is going to help the team perform better on the field. The $20 million plan is said to include improvements to landscaping, parking, seating, the field and irrigation, and more. Renovations are to be paid for by the kickers and could go on into the year 2050. The agreement would relieve the city from upkeep of the stadium and could potentially create income for the city when used as an event space for festivals and concerts during the team's off-season. The kickers have been playing at City Stadium since 1995 and hope to keep the ball rolling with this new agreement for at least another 40 years. For VCU Insight, I'm Sasha Jerome. The lease will be considered at the next City Council meeting on December 12th. Do you like original art? Would you like to help female artists in Africa? Well, you can do both as some have at the 27th annual Northside Holiday Art Walk. Yvonne Hewlett reports.
It's the most amazing day of the season. I look forward to it every year and look at this weather. Participants were excited for this year's holiday art walk in the Westwood area of Richmond's north side. Nine residents opened their homes as open studios for artists to showcase their work. Jewelry, pottery, paintings and even scented candles were among the displays. Director Lisa Fornes welcomed artists of all ages. We have people who are still in college and we have veteran artists who have been doing Doing the show almost the entire 27 years that it's been going on. So it's a really great multi-generational, multi-talent event. The Northside Holiday Art Walk has grown 33% in vendor participation since last year. Some vendors are even contributing portions of their profits to charity. One nonprofit, Dada's and Design, raises money for poverty-stricken women in Tanzania by selling their hand-woven African prints. Vice President Suzanne Spooner Munch says customers at the Art Walk have been very supportive. It's been absolutely awesome, and it's been fun to see the people come year after year and recognize our products and buy the new things and ask how the women in the village are doing. Spooner, along with other participants of the Art Walk, continue to work towards keeping the Richmond art scene alive. For VCU Insight, Yvonne Hewlett. Dada's in Design raised nearly $1,500 at the Northside Art Walk. If you would like to help the women of Tanzania, you can visit their website at dadasanddesign.com. Making your own hard liquor used to be illegal, but not anymore. That's why these moonshine distilleries came together for the first of its kind of festival. The Moonshine Festival hit the Richmond International Raceway Saturday, November 19th, where some local and out-of-state distilleries came together to give attendees a shot of fun. Tickets allowed unlimited samples of different types of moonshine for festival goers to taste. Guests could even meet Tim Smith of Discovery's hit TV show, Moonshiners. Live music, local food, vendors, and moonshine were all enjoyed by those who showed up. Last year's event was also held at the Richmond International Raceway. Next year's schedule for the event has not been posted. However, you can check the website at www.vamoonshinefestival.com for information on future events. And that does it for this edition of VCU Insight. Make sure to check out our website at insight.vcu.edu. And you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under VCU Insight. Contact us with any stories you'd like to see on our show. And if you missed our show or would like to watch it again, you can find us on YouTube at VCU Insight. Thanks for watching. I'm Tiffany Hill. And I'm Rakesha Johnson. We'll see you next time.